Thank you for joining. Ooh, thank you for joining us. Um, I am so excited to be introducing and being part of this panel. Um, as you may know, Games for Change executive produced our first virtual reality documentary called On the Morning You Wake to the End of the World. It was an amazing collaboration with a lot of partners, um, including Princeton University, Meta, Oculus VR for Good. Um, it was produced by Atlas V or Atlas V and Archer's Mark, two incredible uh, uh, creative studios in France and the UK who together had made the project called Notes on Blindness, which some of you might have seen, award-winning piece, and also had partners um, and funding from the British Film Institute and Arte. Um, and we've ha brought more and more partners along the way to help bring this piece to reality and, and to bring it out in the world. So it's been a passion project of mine. Um, and after four long years of, of production, um, from, uh, we are just thrilled to be presenting it now around the world. Um, the piece is downstairs in the uh, XR Immersive Arcade. Um, and I'm honored to be talking to some of the key figures that are working on the impact campaign. So while we presented this piece in 2019 with a vertical slice, a, a pilot that we had made with funding from the MacArthur Foundation, that was really the beginning of making the film. And now that the film is finished, we are focusing, Games for Change is focusing on building out an impact campaign. And I think there's a lot of interesting things to learn that we've learned along the way about how to create an effective campaign that ultimately brings these important pieces out into the communities we're looking to serve. So today we're going to be talking with panelists Sharon Weiner of the Carnegie Foundation, Alex Gleaser of Princeton University, Ray Atchison of ICANN and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and Michaela Ternaski holland of Games for Change. So each of these people are remarkable on their own, but together they are the engine behind a multi-year long impact strategy surrounding the threat and disarmament of nuclear weapons. So I'd like to begin by first showing a short clip, a trailer that we made about the piece um, to give you a sense, if you haven't seen, seen the experience, of kind of what, 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 we, what we're building. Can you show? On the morning you wake to the end of the world, take your body back to the kai, to the place our kupuna taught us life began. First pole, then coral, then slime, then a whole universe fitting into a space smaller than a grain of sand. Nine one one, please fire ambulance. I just got an alert on my phone saying there was a ballistic missile inbound. Yeah, we just got it too. As much as you know, that's how much we know. Thank you for showing that. So in 2017, uh, Princeton University approached Games for Change with an idea to create an interactive experience to help elevate the conversation about the threat of nuclear weapons. Um, and I'm happy to be sitting next to my friend now, Dr. Alex Glazer, who um, conceived the idea along with his partner on the team. Uh, I'd like to, uh, before we kind of dive into that story, I'd love our panelists uh, to give an introduction to themselves and a little bit about their work, and then we'll talk more about the project. Alex, why don't you start? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Susanna, uh, for having us uh, here um, on this uh, panel. I'm Alex Glaser. I'm an associate professor at uh, Princeton University. I'm trained as a physicist, but I have appointments in the public policy school and in the School of Engineering um, at, at Princeton. I'm also part of a program uh, called the Program on Science and Global Security, which has been around for uh, almost 50 years now, um, about 20, 25 people working on mostly uh, nuclear security uh, issues. 
Yeah, it's, it's a pretty impressive team. Um, it's amazing what you're doing there. Um, and we'll get back to your story and your, your fascination with virtual reality <laughs> in a second as a side job. Um, Sharon, why don't you share about your work at Carnegie? Sure. So I'm Sharon Weiner. I'm a senior resident fellow at the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And what that means is I help with a portfolio of projects and ideas about how to reduce nuclear dangers in the world. Thank you. Ray. Hi, uh, I'm Ray Atchison. I'm with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, but I'm also part of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, which won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for our work to get governments to prohibit nuclear weapons with a legally binding treaty in 2017. Um, and I'm also a visiting researcher at Alex's program, which is originally how I got roped into this VR work. And Michaela. My name is Michaela Chernaski Holland. I have a background as an XR creator and storyteller. I first got my start being interested in how journalism can be more immersive and more interactive, and then slowly fell into a less astringent type of storytelling and what I like to call social impact storytelling, which I think really aligns with the Games for Change mission. And so I've since then uh, consulted and consulted on many social impact, immersive, interactive projects, which is how I was able to get connected to Games for Change. And I've been working closely with Susanna and the rest of this amazing team on strategizing how we not just distribute the piece, but what I like to say is mobilize the experience, give it its own wheels and bring it out to the communities and showcase it to different groups of people, different audiences to really create the impact of the experience. Great, and we're so happy to have you. All right, Alex. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. <laughs> I remember it was 2017, right? That's right. There was a different administration. That's correct. <laughs> and you said, I think we need to elevate this conversation. Um, can you tell me what was it about that time, uh, other than that, um, but, but made you think that it was time to pursue a creative project? Um, well, but I already mentioned I'm, I'm part of this program, which has been around for a very long time, um, and my, my colleagues in the United States in the 1980s uh, worked on these issues already, obviously, and, but, and I think it was a very different uh, time. As it was on everyone's uh, mind. Uh, I think this sort of may come up in the conversation. Obviously, there was uh, a big protest uh, you know, in uh, Central Park uh, in 1982, a million people. Uh, Carl Sagan about you know, nuclear winter the day after. And that's 30 uh, years ago. Um, but more like 40 years ago, I guess. Is it 40? 40. I'm really old. Okay. So, so it was very visible at the time, and I think for uh, folks like us, uh, groups, at, you know, think tanks and universities, I think it was a little easier to participate in the debate, uh, both on the policy but also on the, in the political debate uh, at, at the time. And all this, of course, uh, has changed with the end of the Cold War. Uh, when sort of nuclear issues slowly faded into the background. And I think most of us had sort of forgotten about, uh, you know, what nuclear weapons uh, are and, and, you know, who has them, how many they are, et cetera. And um, you, know, you already mentioned the, uh, the election, November 2016, and, you know, very quickly after the inauguration, it became clear that, you know, a war with Iran or even a nuclear war with uh, North Korea, um, you know, might be in the cards. I remember, you know, um, the president at the time during a press conference, I think it was August 2017, said, uh, you know, North Korea will be met with uh, fire and fury. With fire and fury. Um, uh, the world has never seen. And um, I think there was sort of a perception, I mean, among everyone, among us, um, no one really knew how to how to deal with this um, sort of new, uh, you know, this comeback of nuclear issues. Um, Tamara Patton, uh, you already alluded to her. Um, she's now a postdoc at, uh, at MIT. She was a part of our team. Uh, we, she, she and I, we already had um, been working on virtual reality projects unrelated, and we decided, you know, we we sort of have to go back to the basics, and uh, our sort of academic approach is not enough. And we thought uh, a virtual reality experience could be one way to sort of re-engage the public, reach a younger audience, uh, perhaps, and, um, um, and um, raise the awareness of nuclear risks um, you know, as a driver for policy action. So we, uh, we called Games for Change, and Susanna and uh, you know, the team picked up the phone. 
and um, sort of agreed uh, to at least try and raise some seed funding. And we, we did raise that money uh, through the MacArthur Foundation, which was enough to produce a vertical slice. Um, we, you know, together with you, we found Archer's uh, Mark and Atlas V or Atlas V um, as our creative partners, and that's how the, yeah. the story began. I, I have to say, when you when you made that call and said there's an opportunity to that you wanted to create a, a, a piece of media around this, I have to say that this issue has like stayed with me because I was around in the '80s and I saw the day after, and I will never forget. I will never forget watching that that movie on TV, and you know, and and what we've been talking about a lot about is that the threat has never gone away. Like, they're still there, right? We're just not talking about it, right? And that's, and that just really struck me. And I was like, wow, we can really create something to help people talk about it and realize um, the, the, the issue is alive and, and something that we need to deal with. Um, the other thing uh, that I think is, is worth uh, talking about is the story itself. Because I think the choice to, um, tell the story about this incident in Hawaii, and if people don't know, this is a real incident that happened in 2018, um, and how the story came to us. And tell a little bit about Tamara. Yeah, um, well, the story, I, I think maybe it's best to actually uh, sort of recap what we didn't want to do, I yeah. guess, in the beginning. That's how we started. I think we really, we weren't sure what we wanted uh, to tell. We wanted to tell a story, um, but we didn't, uh, want to sort of sensationalize um, the um, the topic, uh, I, and uh, quite frankly, I work a lot with numbers, I guess, uh, but I, I don't think the numbers alone uh, can convey um, sort of really what's unique about uh, about nuclear weapons. You know, to say it's hard to connect to if you're just talking like, right figuratively or, or about numbers. So yeah. you know, you have let's say a submarine has hundreds of nuclear weapons that have uh, 10 million. Um, um, uh, tons of TNT equivalent p explosive power. You know, what, what does it mean, 10 million tons of TNT? Right. No one can um, really wrap their head around this. Uh, I think we, I do remember uh, the first meeting in London when we sat around the table and were brainstorming. You know, someone said, we, we don't want to have a mushroom cloud, even though there's one now, yeah. a little, a small one. Um, but again, we didn't want uh, to go down that road, a route, which I think is very tempting with nuclear issues to sort of just show how big it is and, and, how, and how much. So we said we didn't want to do that either. Instead, we wanted uh, to connect. We put, wanted to put humans first. We wanted to connect to the audience, um, um, yeah. you know, on a, on a personal level, maybe even intimate level. Um, so, and at, at some point, um, this was, I think, July 2018, someone mentioned, well, wasn't there a missile alert? And, and Tamara, um, who is from Hawaii uh, originally, um, she, uh, and she had sort of a very uh, unique um, sort of experience uh, there too. She's still connected with friends and family uh, through her WhatsApp and, and other chat groups. And uh, you know, it was 8 o'clock in the morning in Hawaii. It was 2 p.m. here in New York. And uh, she was working in the library. And you know, suddenly, her, you know, the the messages were coming in and her friends were asking, Tamara, you're the expert, what should we do? You know, should we go you know, inside? Should we go um, um, and, and hide uh, somewhere else? And um, so she was telling us about this and I think she sort of passed the, or read out the messages. And, and I think it was really in this moment that for you know, everyone in the room, it was so that, that's exactly the story yeah. we were looking for. I mean, it, it's, you know, it was there all along, I guess, <laughs> but it, it took that, you know, that moment to realize that's uh, a perfect story, so to speak. 38 minutes uh, was the time between the original warning, the, the first message, and the second one. And we felt that's, that's probably the time yeah. we're going to use for that experience. Yeah. So uh, the intent to make this uh, a human story about the human effects of the threat of nuclear weapons and something that can affect all of us Around the around the world, right? That was the the, the connection, um, and I think I mean I think it achieves that. I think you know you, it, it's impossible not to see the experience and and feel you know and, and to relate to what uh, these people actually went through, um, and that, I think that's actually at the heart of what the impact campaign's about, right? And what the and and the work that you do, Michaela, in translating the intention of the right creators and the people behind it, and um, and 
figure out how to bring that to the people. And that's a whole creative process and, as well. Um, I'd love to you talk a little bit about, you know, what is it? What, what is an anti-campaign and what does it take to put it together? Yeah. Um, just a quick fun fact, this moment for me is very full circle because Games for Change 2019, I was actually sitting in the audience watching Susanna and Alex talk about this project with the Archer's Mark team with Tamara, and they showed the vertical slice, and I just remember sitting in the audience at the time feeling like so amazed by the work and the collaboration that was happening by these entities and feeling so um, inspired to continue working in myself and XR for Change, but also to one day dream about working with that team. Oh. So thank you so much. This is such a full circle moment for me. Um, an impact campaign for me, you know, it, it, comes it comes from, I think, a documentary film background where it's not just about creating a piece of content and then distributing it in a, in a traditional platform or on a traditional movie theater screen and just allowing the audience to walk away saying, well, that was a great piece of media. The impact campaign answers the question, now what? Right? So once we absorb a piece of storytelling, what is the facilitation process after that piece of storytelling to help guide people into a place of taking action or to help guide people into a place of better, deeper understanding of a, of a topic? And so this impact campaign was very difficult in a lot of ways for me because the idea of nuclear weapons was very foreign to me. Um, I had no idea that this was still a threat that we faced coming into this project. I was terrified because I was not a nuclear weapons expert, and Susanna very graciously told me, you know, you'll be supported by incredible experts who I get to sit on this panel with right now, and you really get to cast a vision of how you think people should be impacted. And so it was really about staying true to the piece, right? It was about making sure we weren't sensationalizing nuclear weapons, making sure people walk away from on the morning you wake not feeling hopeless, making sure we are not just focusing on the material impact, right? So suddenly you come out of the experience and if we hit you with a ton of, a ton of facts, like that's basically taking you out of the human interest story. So keeping you engaged with the human interest story even after you get out of headset. So, I like to break down the impact campaign in three stages. We have an onboarding stage, which is getting you not only familiar to the topic and the theme, but also familiar with the actual um, experience of being in a headset. We don't want anyone to ever feel alienated by technology. We want to make technology as inclusive as possible. So we find that VR can be very intimidating. So a part of our impact campaign is not just about Descent, not just about making sure people are aware of nuclear weapons, but also to make sure people feel comfortable inside of a headset. So it's this careful balance of un uncomfortability and comfortability. And then from there, we show them the experience, which is incredible and has been so carefully crafted that we then have to understand how do you facilitate an aftercare experience? How do you facilitate integration back into real life? How do you make sure someone feels equipped with tools and understanding and how they can get involved and how they can be a part of what we really talk about is changing the narrative. It's not about suddenly tomorrow we're going to wake up and the weapons are gone, but how can you be a part of a movement that is already happening around nuclear disarmament and how can you be a part of changing the narrative, not just for you today, but for your future generations to come. And that sense of hope and security and that sense of understanding around what home means to you is how we continue to push the impact campaign into different places in a compassionate, caring, understanding way. Um, I, you mentioned earlier, which we talked about when you came on board, you were like, oh, I don't know anything about nuclear weapons, which is sort of like the point. Like, how awesome is it that we brought somebody in to run the campaign, right? Like, we've already, we already succeeded by, by, by raising awareness uh, with someone uh, who wasn't familiar with, it, with the issue. <laughs> but you talked about, like, but we did build, we, we started with a strong foundation because we had Alex and Tamara, right, experts. We knew that we had, we had some support from MacArthur Foundation who um, have been very, were very, very active in this field. But we also focus a lot about building an ecosystem around us and bringing in those experts. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the fellow, you know, ship program and how they support you and, and work with you. 100%. So I am not just the one and only person that works on this impact campaign. So I have to give a huge shout out to my team, not only the Games for Change staff, but also Aaron Budd, who is my colleague who's in the audience. Um, Aaron helps me create and produce all of these different impact activations. And one of the things we're creating is these wraparound materials. And we're also speaking to a lot of different people about partnerships and how we make these wraparound material materials flexible. But when you get into the threads of the impact material, when you get into the threads of these partnerships, sometimes 
um, it feels to me like I don't know who exactly these people are we're speaking to, or I don't exactly know how I should be framing a question, or how I should be framing the understanding around nuclear threat. And that's where the Impact Fellows Program, which we've put together with Games for Change, really comes in as a support system. And so I have the pleasure and the honor to be working with three amazing fellows. One of them is sitting right next to me, Ray Atchison. Um, the other two are Cynthia Lazaroff, who actually, Cynthia went through the experience in Hawaii. She was in Kauai at the time and had the alert come to her. Um, and that alert really sort of re reignited her activism within the nuclear threat space, because at the time she was working more in climate change. And then our third um, impact fellow is lovely Umayam, who is an incredible um, policy expert who has worked for the DC Capitol Hill, but has now gone on to create and build her own artist collective around how they create really incredible um, artistic interpretations of nuclear threats and the threats of nuclear weapons. Um, and so these three um, amazing fellows we hop on a call once a month, um, and we connect, and we say, you know, what's next? Like, how do we build the survey? What organizations do we need to add? If we're in Vienna, how do we specifically tie it back to ICANN and what they're doing with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons? If we're here in New York, how do we tie it back specifically to NICAN? And how do we make something that feels authentic, not only to the voice of the story, but authentic to the voice of these experts and these activists and these movement creators who are building and ushering in the new era of abolition? Um, and I think that's been really exciting and also allows us to be given the opportunity to be seen in spaces like the United Nations. Like Ray and I right now are currently working together for the NPT, which is the... Non-proliferation treaty. See, thank you so much, Ray. <laughs> um, which is going to be taking place, um, a, a large conference is taking place at the United Nations in New York through the month of August. And so because of our connection to Ray, Ray has a connection to the United Nations, and we're going to be showcasing the project at the United Nations in August. And so this is really, I think, a really amazing collaboration that I'm, I'm looking to facilitate. Sorry, I hit the mic. Um, so it's something we talk about Games for Change for years, uh, and starting with games too, is that this cross-sector partnership really is valuable. You need content matter experts, subject matter experts involved in projects in order to maintain authenticity and, and to ensure that something is created that can actually have that desired impact. But that's as important in the, in the distribution, the marketing, and the impact campaigns, right? It's, um, you know, it's hard to build everything on your own. Mm -hmm. um, if, you can, if you can create a community around you, right, that believe in this project, they have the ability to help make those introductions and extensions and help, help reach it. So yeah, we're, we're really grateful for the work that all of our fellows do. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit and talk at a, at a higher level about this issue about it, can you, for this audience here, Alex, frame the current state of the threat of nuclear weapons and how we got here? Okay. Like, how bad is it? Okay, <laughs> so much to say, um, but I'll be brief, and my, my colleagues here on the panel can also, could, yeah, feel uh, free to uh, add your perspectives in. too. Um, but very briefly, I would say perhaps two or three things. Um, one, just in terms of numbers, real quick, there are about uh, 10,000, uh, 12,000 uh, nuclear weapons around, depending on how you count them. Uh, you know, nine weapon states, uh, but the US and Russia have sort of more than 90% uh, of these weapons. Um, more than 2,000, around 2,000 are ready to go at, you know, any, um, mm. at any moment. Um, you know, within minutes, uh, they would be ready um, for launch. Um, as you Probably, we all know that nuclear weapons are, um, uh, you know, they're big, they're uh, unique, they're devastating. Uh, there really are no small nuclear weapons. That's sort of a new narrative that is mm -hmm. now sometimes uh, used uh, in, in the conversation. Um, most of them are much, much larger than what we've seen in Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. There was just a video, I think, three days ago, a New York City emergency management put oh, it so out. I guess you don't want to give it extra views. It already has almost a million, I believe. But um, so uh, this is you, what to do in a nuclear when uh, the big one hits, I guess uh, the host uh, says. And it's sort of civil defense, uh, 1960s uh, uh, redux. It's very, I think, very problematic. Duck and cover. Uh, essentially, uh, the host says, well, uh, so what do you, should you do? You know, if you're outside, go inside, shut the windows. I mean, that sort of uh, thing. I mean, it's really. 
um, this is not, in my view, the way um, to uh, approach this um, issue. So that's uh, number one. I mean, this is uh, where we are. Number two is, as I mentioned, as you know, when the Cold War ended um, a, l a long time ago, um, you know, in the early 1990s, and um, I think there was sort of a hope that um, perhaps this problem would simply go away, and you may think maybe we should just wait until they fall apart. Um, so to speak, but that's unfortunately not going to work. Uh, in fact, most or all nuclear weapon states are now pouring uh, you know, billions of dollars into modernizing uh, these weapons. And you, this is really the first time since the end of the Cold War that sort of now the next generation of weapons that are being uh, developed and, and, and funded. And you know, they will, if nothing else happens, exist for the next 50 uh, to 100 years or so. So that's uh, really something that uh, that um, keeps me up at night, if, if you will. I mean, if you think about the, the, the future commanders of um, you know, one of those submarines, uh, is, uh, you know, these are kids who are in elementary school right now. You know, they're between five and 10 years old. These are the commanders of, of the submarines we're going to build in the 2040s or uh, 2050s. I mean, that's what we're sort of up to um, wow. right, right now. Wow. Um, and, and then uh, finally, perhaps, um, you know, briefly about threats. I mean, again, this, uh, this um, is now, again, uh, prominent. This is not something we anticipated, of course. You know, after Trump, uh, then the pandemic, uh, and now, you know, we have a war in, in Europe. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that every weapon state, uh, you know, threat, uh, threatens to use their weapons. I mean, that's sort of part of the concept of, of deterrence. You have, it has to be credible. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the Trump tweets. Um, now, you know, Putin has used um, similar threats. So um, again, um, we have to keep in mind that every weapon state is sort of ready mm -hmm. to use them. Uh, single use is, is catastrophic, um, but what worries me, and probably many of us, is really also the risk of, of escalation. Uh, it's not just one uh, nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Uh, you know, we do have to worry about escalation, and there's sort of a, I think, famous uh, or noteworthy quote from um, the former uh, head of strategic command uh, who recently said about war games that they play in the Pentagon. Um, you know, let me tell you, I, I have the quote uh, written down, but I'm slightly paraphrasing. It says, it ends bad uh, every time uh, it ends in global thermonuclear war uh, when we play these games. Um, so that's sort of the downs. I mean, these are the, 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 the bad news, but I think there are also some good news, uh, and, <laughs> which is maybe an opportunity for, for uh, Ray uh, to, to chime in on the TPNW or, you know, or others. Yeah, Ray, you're just doing incredible work. I mean, really. Uh, I'm so glad that the Nobel Peace Prize recognized the work that you do with ICANN. Um, and you really, you're a force. I mean, really great. I'd love you to share more about your perspective on this and what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And um, just to pick up on what Alex was talking about with the New York PSA, I think it's worth putting that into the context of this attempt globally that we've seen with the invasion of Ukraine and the threats from, uh, from Russia around the use of nuclear weapons. There's been this weird attempt to kind of normalize nuclear war globally. Like, don't worry, it won't be that bad even if it happens. And this happened maybe, it started happening a few weeks after the first threats were made. And the New York Times even ran this piece that used about 10 different euphemisms for nuclear weapons. Like they stopped saying the word weapon and they were talking about lower yield nuclear weapons and it won't be as destructive and um, it'll cause less damage and, and all of these things. And it's so strange. So I, I put the, the PSA into that framework of, um, you know, rather than actually addressing the core problem of nuclear weapons, which is that they still exist, the United States possesses almost as many as Russia does. The United States has threatened many times to use nuclear weapons. The United States has actually used nuclear weapons. Um, and all of the nuclear armed states have tested nuclear weapons around the world, more than 2,000 nuclear tests, which have had devastating impacts on communities around the world. Um, all of us live with radiation in our bodies from these atmospheric nuclear tests that have taken place throughout the nuclear age. And rather than addressing any of that and, and dealing with the weapons 
uh, to eliminate, to do disarmament, um, which everyone is legally bound to, including most of the nuclear armed states. Instead of that, they just try and make it not a problem. It's not something you have to worry about, and it won't be that bad if it happens. So when I'm thinking about the, the negatives and the positives, and you know where we are, where is the needle, are we moving forward or backward, I feel like that sort of thermometer has exploded in a way, because there's so many forces working for and against uh, nuclear weapons. But I think it's also really important to recognize that we ourselves are a force. Um, as organizers, as activists, as folks making art, being creative, and um, trying to push policy from as many different directions as we can. And so it's not that we're worse off than we were, better off than we are. Um, it's, it's more just that we have, we have this big bad. We have the nuclear weapons. We have the nuclear armed states. Um, and we are the small heroes or you know, actors who are trying to take down the big bad and we're attacking it from as many different sides as we can because it is uh, a, a massive entity. It's, it's the governments that possess nuclear weapons, which are only nine. So in that sense, it's, it's a contained problem. Um, but it's also the financial investments in nuclear weapons, the, the, the profiteering that goes on. It's private corporations that um, actually manufacture nuclear weapons and that run the nuclear weapon labs. So a lot of the big weapons manufacturers that you may have heard of, like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, these are the same companies that are making nuclear weapons. So there's an economic side to this. And then there's, there's also sort of like the academic, you know, industrial complex around the myths of nuclear weapons that get manufactured. The, the nuclear deterrence theory that we're, that we're all force fed of it's, it's the gospel truth that nuclear weapons prevent war and maintain stability in the world, which I think we can see right now very clearly is not at all the case. Um, so we're up against this, but we have a lot of tools in our toolbox to, um, to really confront this. And I think one of the things that, um, that I've been working on for many years that, I, that has been really uh, a, a positive, game-changing um, effort has been the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So this is the first international treaty that actually says nuclear weapons are illegal for everybody and it prohibits all nuclear weapon related activities and it provides a framework to eliminate existing arsenals. And this was an initiative that came about through ICANN working with governments, non-nuclear armed governments, um, to really uh, push this through the United Nations system. It took us many years uh, and we finally adopted this treaty in 2017. So the, the, the problem is that none of the nuclear armed states have joined the treaty, and they say they never will, including the democracies, which is, you know, um, very interesting. Uh, and so that's sort of, they, they stand outside of this now global agreement that almost all other countries in the world are part of. Um, and part of our work now in the, in the post-treaty landscape is to, is to stigmatize nuclear weapons right. so that we can compel these countries to come on board. So we're shifting, we're trying to shift the narratives and the landscape around nuclear weapons in order to, to make it increasingly uncomfortable and untenable for them to remain outside of this treaty and to, to maintain nuclear weapons. And so the economic angle that I was talking about is a really important one here. So in New York City, um, we actually managed to get, after many years, the New York City Council to adopt legislation that is intended to remove all New York City pension funds from nuclear weapon producing companies. So just like the city and other cities are divesting from fossil fuels, mm -hmm. there's a divestment movement from nuclear weapons. And so we do have that legislation. It was adopted uh, in December 2021. It still needs to be implemented under the city council and with this mayor, um, but it is on the books. If you want to get involved in that work, um, one of the leaders of NICAN, the, the New York um, arm of, of ICANN, is here in the room over there, Kathleen Sullivan. So go see her afterwards, because um, we need people to help us get this legislation implemented now that it's passed. Um, we also have a broad divestment 
uh, element to our work called Don't Bank on the Bomb. So you can find out if money in your bank is going towards nuclear weapons. You can withdraw your money. You can pressure your pension funds, your financial institutions to withdraw money. Um, there's a I can cities appeal that you can get involved in. So we've got cities around the world, including many in the United States, that are saying they support the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and they want the US government to join. And so that's, a, that's work that's going on in all the nuclear armed states. Um, getting yeah. Congress people, parliamentarians, other elected officials to support the treaty and to agitate for it and to call for debates in parliament or in Congress on nuclear weapons is super important. Um, and I think one of the biggest uh, sort of ongoing tasks beside these specific uh, campaigns, which we have worked into the impact campaign for this film, of course, too, in the aftercare surveys, beyond those specific actions that people can take, I think one of the most important advances that we have made in recent years has really been to change who is included in discussions on nuclear weapons and to confront the dominant mainstream narrative around nuclear weapons that I was talking about as being part of sort of the academic, military, industrial complex, perpetuating the myths of, of deterrence and stability, um, and really changing the ideas around what's credible to say about nuclear weapons, who gets to be part of this conversation. Um, and I think that this film really helps advance that aspect of the work too, because it's, it's people who have been affected by nuclear weapons in a very real, tangible way that get to speak in this film. It's not people sitting in conference rooms. It's not people sitting in you know, capitals of nuclear armed states. It's everyday, ordinary people who have felt the very, very real pain of nuclear weapons that, that get to have their voice. Yeah, so um, I'm wondering if you and Michaela can talk a little bit about what, what's happening now with uh, the peace and the ICANN and ICANN, because that's part of the strategy is to empower people on the ground who are running NGOs and activists to use, to use the peace. So there's one part of it is us doing a pop-up activation at the UN, right? Or going to, to Vienna for uh, the, the treaty a conference that you went to, but also to empower others to use it. So can you talk a little bit about the cases that are going around? I would love to. I think maybe we'd even take it a step back and talk about our incredible funders who are helping support yes. our work. Yes, OK, great. I will do that. You want to do it? I was just going to lean over to Sharon. Sharon, yes. So, so Not Sharon. me personally. <laughs> yes. So um, what's also kind of interesting to, to note is that the, the film itself was funded by media partners for the most part. We had B British Film Institute, Arte in France, a public bro broadcaster in France. There were some tax credits from France and the UK, and then Meta VR for good. But when it came to the impact campaign, we turned back to the people in the nuclear weapons um, uh, the, the security issues, and we received funding from organizations like Carnegie Corporation and others who um, believe that this piece of media can actually be part of, of ongoing work to, to change the narrative. And I was wondering, um, Sharon, I, uh, I know you have a lot of really interesting thoughts about the role of art in, in, in activism and things. I was wondering if you can share about what, what you do and, and some of that interest, why there was interest. Sure. So the Carnegie Corporation's been interested in reducing the danger of nuclear weapons and helping people do that for a long, long time. But one of the big barriers is, I mean, everybody on this panel, I think now, lives, eats, and sleeps something about nuclear weapons. Is that fair to say, Michaela? Wow. Um, <laughs> most people don't pay any attention to them at all. Right? And if they're not paying attention, then there's no action. And if there's no action, there's no leverage. No leverage, no change. And so the question is, how do you convince people to stop ignoring the nuclear weapons that are there because they're paying attention to you, right? They're being used in your name. So the question is, how do you get people to pay attention to those nuclear weapons and then to exert agency over where that attention leaves them? And there's a long history of some people trying to do this periodically. I mean, for some people like me, uh, my history with nuclear weapons goes back to day one. I was born at Strategic Air Command, which is the base that's in charge of nuclear weapons. And I grew up on a farm in the Midwest where we had cows, pigs, and just west were 150 inter intercontinental ballistic missiles with megaton warheads on the top. So 
we knew that the New York City Public Service announcement of, oh, just go inside and close your windows was not going to save us. My lived experience connects me to nuclear weapons. But for most people, they, they don't have that lived experience. So there, there have been some, so for example, the early scientists with uh, the nuclear program, they tried to use science and weapons effects and scientific understanding to get people to pay attention to nuclear weapons issues. And soon after that, they inspired songwriters. There's an early um, folk song called Old Man Adam, which explains that all men can be cremated equally. Uh, Bob Dylan, in an interview with Rolling Stone in 2007, says nuclear weapons inspired the music we made because you just couldn't look at that destructive capability and pretend that it wasn't there. Or if you move on to visual artists, Salvador Dali, one of his very first exhibitions was about nuclear weapons. He said you couldn't look at the danger of nuclear weapons, that it shook him seismically, and that he had to do something different. Or think of the art of Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock said you couldn't paint like you were in the Renaissance once you knew about nuclear weapons. Huh. There have been books written about nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm sitting here in the middle of two authors, and I'm thinking about John Hershey, whose bo book on Hiroshima was published in 1946, still in print, sold 100 million copies. I wish the same for both of you in your books. <laughs> um, there have been movies about nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons effects, about s fictionalized stories. There have been a few atomic monsters that are created, all trying to get people to pay attention to these issues. Or Susanna, you mentioned The Day After. 1983 show on, shown on US TV, I think there were 100 million viewers. It was also shown on Soviet state TV a few years later. Ronald Reagan credited that movie with changing his mind about nuclear weapons. And of course, he then meets Mikhail Gorbachev in Reykjavik, and they agree to get rid of them until the bureaucracy convinces them that that's not a good idea, and they walk back on that promise. So. One of the exciting things about On the Morning You Wake and the use of VR to do this and tell this story is that prior to VR, all of these efforts to engage people are two-dimensional. They invite you to engage with nuclear weapons, but by listening to someone else. VR, On the Morning You Wake, asks you to participate in the lived experience of people who thought they were going to die in a nuclear attack. So you're not passively viewing. You are there experiencing what they experienced. And I think that's part of the power of this project, is it, it tells you you can't be passive about those nuclear weapons that you're not paying attention to. And so it invites you to understand what those nuclear weapons would do to you and what it would be like to wake up one morning and realize that might be your last morning. Yeah. I mean, that's what we, we want to, we've always wanted to connect with people at a human level, right? Put them, make them have, not only feel um, empathy and, and compassion for what people would, would, would went through, but also motivated, right? Go back to the motivation to do something. Yeah. Uh, did you have something else? I, no, I was, I was just gonna say, and I won't do a spoiler here, but one of the, I've seen a lot of VR things. I have VR projects, so VR for me is fun, but it's not new. There's still a part of this movie where I cry. Mm. Because you're sitting there and you experience the frustration of someone who has tried everything they can do, and it's not enough. Mm. Yeah. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about the campaign itself. So uh, just to get a, a, a sense of what, what your strategy has been and how you've worked with this constellation of partners. So why don't you, it, I don't think we have time for our video. Our video. Okay. What's that? Do you think we do? Uh, I, yeah. Sure. Yeah, let's show the second video. I think it's like 30 seconds. It's a minute 30, but if you want to mute it, and then I can talk over. Yeah, can you do that? Do two things at once. I'm assuming I have a thumbs up somewhere. You going to show it? Video two without sound? Is this video one? OK. Yeah, why don't you explain what's happening here? Sure. So this is the ICANN Nuclear Ban Forum, which was produced and hosted by the ICANN organization that Ray works very closely with. And basically, this was the start of a week of events that happened in Vienna, Austria, around the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And this was a way for both people who work actively in human rights organizations, people who work actively as citizens of different 
um, places as well as uh, policymakers and researchers to come together and have discussions around how they can continue pushing the narrative forward that these weapons need to be disarmed and these weapons need to be eradicated. And so the big thing about our impact campaign is that we're not trying to create a movement. The reality is the movement of nuclear disarmament is already here. And you can see it in this incredible group of panelists that I am sitting next to. It's the reality of what we can do with this amazing piece of artwork, this amazing piece of storytelling, and how we can start to facilitate conversations to deepen people's understanding. And I actually had the pleasure of being able to have another conversation with Ray. And one of the things they said was, the person that needs to see this isn't the person that is already like, yes, let's do this disarmament thing. It's a great rallying for those types of people. But also the people who need to see this are the people who are like, I don't know, maybe. I don't, I, I, I think they're kind of safe and they kind of help us too, right? And then you need to kind of show them, no, it actually puts people in more danger when they're being utilized, right? And so that way we do have a constellation of partners and organizations we work with, but we also have different audience we want to work with. So one of the main audiences is policymakers, people who get to make decisions for other people. Um, we call that grass tops in our, in our strategy documents. And then we also want to empower the grassroots, and the grassroots include not only the organizations like ICANN, but the people who are rallying around ICANN. And so one of the things Games for Change worked on is a virtual reality headset kit. This is like your standard go-to Pelican that can fit four headsets, it can fit two iPads, and it can fit power strips, and it can fit batteries, and it's basically everything you need in one little roll-on suitcase that we gifted two of them to ICANN, so ICANN now owns eight headsets, so that Games for Change isn't the gatekeepers of the technology. We're also making sure we're giving the tools back to the organizations who are already mobilizing themselves. They're already in strategic meetings with diplomats, with people who are on the fence. They're also going to public places, like high schools and universities. Um, another organization we're working with currently is Global Zero, who we're also giving a VR headset kit kit to. And so those really specific grass tops and grassroots are one demographic. And then another demographic, of course, is students and teachers at both the high school and the university level. And a lot of people have asked me, is there curriculum? And a lot of the things I say back to them is, there is a baseline structure for curriculum, but I don't like the idea that a curriculum is one size fits all. We want to make sure we have curricular connections back to whatever the university professor or teacher is talking about in their classroom. We also want to localize the experience. What's amazing about the digital materials we've created is they're very flexible. So it's very easy to add questions specific to that local high school. So if we're in Hawaii, I would want that curriculum to look different than if we were in Virginia. And the reason is, is because when people feel seen within their own communities by the structure that is coming in to teach them something, it creates a deeper understanding and, and a deeper impact. And so my goal with the impact campaign is that the headset experience, the VR, leaves you with a memory, right? It leaves you with an understanding that there were real life people who went through this event. But my goal with the aftercare or the curriculum or the wraparound materials is that we leave you transformed. And what does transformed mean? It just means a change in your behavior. Whether that means you go and have a conversation with somebody that day about it, whether you actually connect to ICANN or Global Zero or Princeton University or the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and you read those materials. Um, and the way we do that is by asking for your cell phone number. It's very intimate, but we want that because we want to be able to text you those web links, not just email you where they might get dropped into spam. And so we try to make an intimate sort of moment happen, even if you stepped away and gone on with your day from the project, through these little ways we create rabbit holes. And that's even with the social media and the website, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit of the impact campaign. Um, one big dream that Susanna and I both have, and I'm just going to put it out there, is a museum <laughs> exhibition yeah, oh for yeah. the project. Um, so if you are a museum curator, if you know someone who's a museum curator and you think they would be interested in curating an exhibit about ICANN, about Princeton, about Carnegie, and all these amazing organizations working to disarm nuclear weapons and then showcase an amazing VR experience, we'd love to have that conversation and we'd love to continue that, um, that dream to move that forward. All right. Well, thank you, Michaela, Ray, Sharon, Alex. It's been a great conversation. Um, I hope you guys will stick around for the rest of the afternoon. If anyone has thoughts or questions, I can't. We can't answer them now.
but they're going to be around. And so we can have that conversation or, or this afternoon between 4.30 and 6 or 5 and 6.30. Meet the speaker sessions that will be happening and hopefully you can meet up with these, with these people later. But thank you so much and thank you. Thank you. <laughs>